The paper actually focuses on this question, which I'm going to call a little bit emphatically the master question. <laughs> what should we do when we discover a disagreement with an epistemic peer about <coughs> proposition P? Uh, now, I want to, in the first part of the talk, which is going to be relatively brief, I want to just lay out a couple of, uh, of assumptions that uh, I'm going to use uh, throughout the talk. And I want to say something about uh, what kind of answer to the master question is a good answer, what, what we should expect from uh, a good answer to uh, this question, okay? So uh, just laying out some sort of desiderata for uh, uh, the answer. And then in the central second part of the talk, I try to propose my own uh, answer to the master question. I'm not going to engage very much with the tons of papers which have been published uh, on the, in the epistemology of disagreement. I'm going to touch on something that has been uh, said just to contrast my view uh, with uh, uh, the other ones, but it's going to be mostly a positive uh, proposal and perhaps I mean, we can we could evaluate its uh, merits vis-a-vis -vis the other proposals uh, uh, which have been put forward uh, uh, in the literature during the Q&A. So this is going to be mostly uh, my take on the master question. So first of all, I'm going to just assume uh, a, a definition of a uh, notion of an epistemic peer, an epistemic party, which has been proposed by Tom Kelly in a 2005 paper and then endorsed by many in the uh, debate, which says that two individuals are epistemic peers, but P, if and only if they have the same evidence with respect to P, and they are equals with respect to what we may call general intellectual virtues, such as thoughtfulness, carefulness, <laughs> honesty, and so on and so forth. This is not the only definition uh, we can find in the literature. There's uh, the competing definition which doesn't mention evidence and uh, general intellectual virtues, but mentions the fact that uh, two individuals are equally likely to get things right. Uh, I don't think that in order for uh, us to appreciate the problem, uh, we really need to choose between the, uh, these two different definitions, so I'm just going to operate under uh, the assumption that this is uh, a good, viable notion of epistemic parity. And, uh, and the second assumption uh, I'm going to make, which again could be the question, is that there is a genuine phenomenon of epistemic peer disagreement. In particular, there is a genuine phenomenon in which two individuals take themselves to be epistemic peers, acknowledge themselves to be epistemic peers, or if you want to add something more, have some reason to think that they are epistemic peers and disagree about uh, uh, a given issue. And uh, I want to say that this is a genuine phenomenon which actually manifests itself in many areas <coughs> of discourse. So I don't want to uh, uh, engage myself with whether uh, we can restrict the scope of the phenomenon for, to just uh, specific areas uh, of discourse. I just want to uh, take uh, the phenomenon to fast back value and see how to cope with it in a various, in a vast uh, uh, array of cases. So it could be like very simple cases, which is the one I'm going to start off with. And then we could go on to discuss like more, much more complicated cases, such as, for instance, moral disagreements or even philosophical disagreements, in which we take our opponent to be our epistemic peer. So for me, these are, uh, these are possible cases of uh, 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 peer disagreement. Okay, so these are the, the two uh, uh, general assumptions that I'm going to make in order for uh, um, the uh, puzzle to get up and running, the puzzle of, uh, that gives rise to the master question. And, uh, Another uh, small clarification uh, is about the interpretation of uh, uh, the master question, which I think could be interpreted in various ways. This is the interpretation I'm after today. Uh, the master question asks what kind, what is the conduct that one has most epistemic normative reason to follow after the discovery of a disagreement with an epistemic here. And I'm going to have this, uh, I mean, perhaps this is not even a definition, but let's say a good word, uh, a good way of uh, uh, identifying uh, what an epistemic normative reason could possibly be. So it's, let's take it 
uh, as a sort of working definition, which is going to be fine for present purposes, I guess, is that an item which could be a mental state, uh, such as, for instance, perceptual experience, or a fact, or a true proposition, so I will be uh, as liberal as possible about uh, uh, these items. Uh, is an epistemic normative reason for an agent A to file, for instance, to believe a proposition or to revise a proposition, uh, a belief in a proposition or to retain one's previous toxic attitude uh, towards a proposition, only if it is something on the basis of which the agent can establish whether believing or retaining the belief or revising the belief, what A's goal is truth. So there is this link between epistemic normative reasons and the truth and uh, here I'm speaking of what, what has most normative epistemic reason to do and the way in which I uh, interpret this idea is that suppose we have all the epistemically uh, relevant items or facts on the table but what I'm interested in is what all these epistemically relevant what kind of conduct these all, uh, all epistemically relevant facts support on balance okay uh, so, if we want to use a slightly different uh, terminology, there's a distinction between uh, the, uh, the kind of normative reason, uh, epistemic uh, normative reason I'm after is not is prototo rather than protanto reason. Okay. So these are uh, the uh, three main ass assumptions that uh, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm making uh, uh, in order to understand that and address the master question. Uh, now, I want to say something uh, uh, very briefly about, uh, uh, first of all, wh why is the master question interesting and why the phenomenon of acknowledged epistemic pure disagreement is interesting uh, to my mind. Uh, and uh, by looking at why the phenomenon is interesting, uh, we could also uh, uh, establish some sort of desiderata for a good answer to this question. Okay, and the way in which I'm going to do this, I'm going to just focus on this so much discussed case in the epistemology of disagreement, which is called the restaurant case, uh, proposed by the Christians and I guess originally in a 2007 paper. It's very, it's very easy. Uh, Alice and Mark disagree about the shares of their bill. Mark says that they are each owe 45 bucks, while Alison says that they each owe 43 bucks, and they take themselves to be epistemic peers, okay? Uh, so, uh, what do we want to explain uh, about this case? Uh, I think that this, this case and the, the phenomenon of uh, epistemic peer disagreement gives rise to a puzzle, okay? And I take it that there are three pieces of the puzzle that we should try to uh, uh, keep together. The first piece of the puzzle is what uh, I'm going to call a sort of appearance of significance of uh, acknowledged epistemic peer disagreement. Uh, and in order to bring this uh, appearance of significance out, let's just see, stipulate that in this case, actually, uh, Alison and Mark ha are in a sort of epistemic super superiority-inferiority re relation. Suppose that Alison has more evidence than Mark has regarding the question, uh, or uh, and they are both aware of this fact. So they discover the disagreement in the question, what should we do? What should they do? Well, it seems that we have a straightforward answer. <coughs> Since Alison has more evidence than Mark has, she can stick to her guns, she can ignore, she can not dogmatically ignore Mark's opinion by saying, well, look, Mark, you have less evidence than I have. So in this case, uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take the disagreement seriously with you. I'm going to stick to my, to my guns. This kind of resolution of disagreement is simply unavailable in cases of acknowledged peer disagreement cases because are, these are cases which we acknowledge that you, our opponent is as well positioned evidentially or epistemically in general as we are. Okay? So, and this, to my mind, seems to create some sort of appearance of significance of the discovery of a disagreement with uh, an acknowledged peer. And I think that many uh, uh, kind of agree with this prima facie appearance of significance because one of the views which has been taken to be like the view to be, which is called either the equal weight view or the conciliationist approach, actually uh, 
uh, draws a lot on this uh, initial appearance of, of uh, significance. Okay? So that's an appearance which deserves to be explained. Of course, the appearance could also be explained away. Okay? So if you don't want to buy the appearance, or if you think that all things considered, we should not endorse the appearance, I think that even in this case, you should tell a story about why these cases seem to be more significant than cases in which there is an acknowledged relation of superiority and inferiority. Okay? So that's the first piece of the puzzle. There's an appearance of significance. Now, let's just look at how this uh, appearance of significance has been endorsed in the, uh, in the debate. And this is from uh, uh, David Christensen's 2009 survey in Philosophy Compass of the Epistemology of Disagreement. Uh, the idea is that in order to make sense of this appearance of significance, we could say something like this. By discovering their disagreement, peers acquire defeating evidence for thinking that they have mistakenly interpreted the shared first order evidence. So the discovery of disagreement counts as new evidence regarding the question at issue, okay? And since it is defeating evidence, since evidence is the kind of thing that makes us revise uh, our doxastic attitudes as we have also seen from previous talk, then the consequence is that if we take this way of endorsing the appearance of significance, then uh, the consequence, the doxastic consequence, is that we should revise our doxastic attitudes. Uh, and for some people, like that Christensen and Adam Elga, this means that we should uh, somehow decrease our degrees of confidence uh, towards the proposition. For other people, such as, for instance, Richard Feldman, this means that we should suspend judgment uh, about uh, the question uh, issue. Okay. So let's go for the suspension of judgment uh, interpretation here. And I guess that it's, I mean, when we focus on the restaurant case, it doesn't matter very much whether we should suspend judgment. Come on, okay, that's, okay let's suspend judgment. That, that's not going to be such a huge problem uh, in this case. Uh, but, I mean, this kind of response to the disagreement seems to be a little bit uh, uh, implausible, or it seems to... Uh, be difficult to swallow when we focus on different kind of cases. Okay, and this and here the second piece of the puzzle kicks in, namely, okay, restaurant cases suspend judgment. No, it's not such a big deal. But suppose we disagree with an acknowledged epistemic peer on things, on issues that matter a lot to us. For instance, political uh, issues or moral issues. In this case, it just seems wrong to be spineless. Okay. It just seems that we should not give up our toxic attitudes, our opinions, our stances, our things that matter that much to us, just because somebody uh, whom we respect epistemically think of the right. So epistemic difference should not be, uh, uh, should not allow, uh, should not force us to revise our toxic attitudes in those cases. So there's some sort of what we might call an anti-spinelessness intuitions, uh, intuition that seems to clash, uh, 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 they seem to clash with uh, 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 the explanation of the appearance of significance uh, that uh, we've seen before. And then there's a third third piece of the puzzle, which is, well, suppose we discover this agreement with an epistemic peer, uh, and we want to resolve this. How, how should we respond? How should we resolve this disagreement? It seems wrong to say, well, I discovered this agreement with my, what, with a person, individual, I took to be my epistemic peer, but now, since I discovered that he disagrees with me, so he disagrees with me, he's wrong, I'm right, and I demote my, uh, I demote his epistemic credential to say, well, since you disagree with me, then you no longer are my epistemic. This seems to be a dogmatic way of uh, uh, resolving the disagreement and uh, sticking to one's guts. And so, another, the third piece of the puzzle is that we don't want to be, we don't want to uh, resolve disagreements in a dogmatic manner. Okay. So, a good answer to the master question: these three pieces of the puzzle gives rise, I guess, to three different desiderata that uh, we might want to satisfy while looking for uh, an answer to the master question. Uh, 
uh, first make sense of the appearance of significance, uh, then somehow vindicate the antispinalness intuition, and a good answer uh, to the master question, it, it's, it's an answer that enables us to resolve the disagreement in a non-dogmatic manner. Okay? So these are, these are going to be uh, my guiding uh, uh, constraints for uh, uh, looking for an, an answer to the master question. Now, what I want to do, basically, is to endorse the appearance of, of significance, okay? Uh, but I want to try to do it in a different way, in a way which doesn't give rise to the clash between uh, suspending judgment and have an anti-spinelessness intuition. And uh, more specifically, the first claim that I'd like to try to defend today is that the epistemic significance of pure disagreement can be spelled out without taking disagreement to act as defeating it. Okay? So, and the hypothesis that I put forward is basically that the discovery of a disagreement with an acknowledged epistemic peer makes some error possibilities concerning the doxastic justification on one's attitude more salient than they were before. Okay, that's the claim I, I, I'd like to <coughs> defend today. So, very briefly on the, uh, the notion of toxastic justification. There's this distinction between toxastic and propositional justification. I say that the existence of the dis distinction it has not been put into question, but there is a lot of debate on which uh, notion is prior. Uh, I don't think that I need to go into these details today because I just need to have the exist. I just need to have the distinction, and one way of uh, uh, cashing it out is by saying that there's a distinction between being justified in believing the P and having a justification to believe the P. So, propositional justification is a property of a proposition uh, uh, relative, for instance, to body of evidence. While uh, toxic justification is a property of the mental state. And usually, I mean, the traditional way of spelling out the relation has been to say that basically doxastic justification is believing, uh, we are just doxastically justified in believing the P when you believe the P on the basis of the good reasons for believing the P. But this kind of uh, uh, understanding of the relation between the two notions has been recently put into question. Uh, this was just to give uh, a possible way of uh, understanding the difference between the two notions. Okay, so this uh, clarifies a bit uh, what I mean by doxastic uh, justification. What kind of error possibility become more salient after uh, the discovery of disagreement? Well, uh, this is uh, an incomplete list, perhaps, but these are the error possibilities that can become salient relative to the uh, doxastic just, uh, justificatory state of one's <coughs> doxastic act. Okay. For instance, it becomes more salient the possibility that one didn't really form the belief on the basis of the evidence because there's been some sort of uh, deviant causal link between the evidence and the belief. Or one form the belief, it, it becomes more salient the possibility that one form the belief on the basis of the evidence in an improper way, for instance, by using an invalid rule of inference. So, in the case of inferential justification, there are these examples in which you have all the relevant pieces of evidence together, but you put them uh, by using uh, an invalid rule of inference. For instance, you, uh, you use a rule of inference that by a conjunction allows you to uh, conclude anything, uh, and this is uh, not a good uh, rule of inference. This is not a good way of putting all the pieces uh, together. And there are many examples in the literature by uh, John Turpin, for instance in a 2010 paper in the philosophy and phenomenological research on the relation between doxastic and propositional justification. So another error possibility uh, that becomes more salient is that the body of evidence does not support the proposition of the P. And another error possibility is that the evidence, as a matter of fact, is not sufficient to conclude anything about P. <coughs> so when you discover disagreement, this kind of error possibilities become more salient then uh, with an, when you discover this agreement with an epistemic peer, with an acknowledged peer, these error possibilities become more salient than they were before. Uh, and what I want to try to suggest 
is that there's a sense in which the fact that the error possibilities become more salient uh, uh, is not uh, uh, equal to say that this agreement is defeating evidence. Okay? And this is the sense I want to try to defend. The discovery of this agreement meets uh, with an epistemic peer. Of course, I'm not going to say that uh, all the time. This is, uh, uh, is going to be omitted. Uh, makes more salient the possibility that one has made a mistake in the formation of one's toxic attitude rather than actualizing this possibility. And if you want, this is the disti distinction between the property of defeasibility and the notion of an epistemic defeater. So, defeasibility is a property of a belief which consists of its being liable to lose uh, its positive epistemic status. In this case, doxastic justification, either totally, so you, you move on from being justified to being unjustified, or partially, if we allow it, justification comes in degrees, you, when you, uh, 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 you can, like, you, are, you can potentially lose some uh, degree of justification. A defeater is exactly something that actualizes this possibility, okay? It's something that uh, uh, makes you lose, either totally or partially, the positive epistemic status of, uh, uh, one's, uh, of, of your belief in the proposition. Uh, and so what I'm trying to say here is that the, the discovery of disagreement is such that it makes more salient the potential defeasibility uh, of uh, one's toxastic attitude, okay? Without entailing the fact that the toxastic attitude is defeated, okay? In a way, if you want, we become, after the discovery of disagreement, we, can, we become more aware of our uh, fallibility, of, our, of the fallibility of our uh, belief with respect uh, to the proposition, the P. Okay, uh, so if this is, uh, uh, if there is a distinction uh, uh, between making more salient the potential divisibility of one's belief and actually defeating uh, one's belief, uh, and so uh, the question is, okay, assume this is correct, what is the epistemic significance of peer disagreement? Why is it important that, what kind of uh, change does this discovery bring out, as a matter of fact? Because I'm not saying that discovery should lead us to change our doxastic attitudes. I'm saying something, in, in a sense, weaker than that, okay? And my idea here is that the fact that the error possibility is concerning the uh, doxastic justification of one's belief, uh, the fact that these error possibilities become more salient is related to the third piece of the puzzle. So to the fact that we want to resolve uh, disagreement in a non-dogmatic manner. And the claim that I want to try to defend is this. In light of the salience of the error possibilities, one cannot easily and non-dogmatically demote one's peer's opinion and stick to one's guts. And the way in which I want to try to uh, uh, show, uh, to try to defend this claim is by actually contrasting uh, uh, this proposal with something that Tom Kelly says in a 2010 paper on peer disagreement higher order evidence. So these are, these are quotes from this uh, uh, passage by Kelly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read that. When one correctly responds to a body of evidence, one typically has some justification for thinking that one has responded correctly. One might very well take up the belief because one recognizes that this is what one's evidence supports, recognizing that P entails knowing that P, and if you, one knows that one's evidence supports a given belief, then one is justified in thinking that one's evidence supports that belief. Okay, uh, what I want to do now is to grant everything. Here, okay. So there might be contentious passages. Uh, I don't wanna. I, I don't. I don't. I don't wanna go into the details. I wanna explain now what these kind of considerations, what kind of role they play in Kelly's view, and I wanna say why, how they relate to my proposal about the epistemic significance of purity. Mm -hmm. Kelly, it seems to me, is saying something like this. Look, uh, when we uh, 
uh, discover this agreement with an epistemic P, or there are cases in which we uh, took up the belief that P, because we uh, recognize that this is what the evidence supports, and there are cases in which we know what the evidence uh, actually supports. And it is this knowledge, okay, I know that the evidence supports the attitude, the, the belief that P. It is in virtue of this knowledge, okay, that I can demote my opponent's opinion by saying, look, uh, in the, for instance, Mark and Allison case, suppose Allison uh, uh, knows that the evidence is such that it, uh, it entails that they each owe 40, 45 bucks, 43 bucks, it doesn't really matter. So, since she knows this, Okay? This kind of knowledge is what enables her to break the epistemic symmetry with Mark. And she says, look, I know this. In virtue of this knowledge, I can non-dogmatically demote your own opinion and uh, stick to my guts. Okay? So that's the idea behind uh, Kelly's uh, uh, proposal. Uh, now, there's a problem with, with uh, this, uh, with this uh, proposal, I, I think. A problem, at least a problem that uh, enables me to bring out uh, the role that uh, the salience of the area of possibilities has uh, in my account. So, I'm going to grant that before the discovery of the disagreement, Alison, Alison is self ascribing this kind of knowledge. I know that the belief that P is supported by the evidence, okay? And I'm, I'm also granting that this is true. So, second assumption, in order for Alison to correctly, well, correctly means from an epistemically uh, perspective, okay, point of view, to correctly demote Mark's opinion on the basis of this ascription, which is Kelly's proposal, I know that the belief that P is supported by the evidence, that the ascription has to be true, because otherwise <coughs> she should not believe that she knows, and so if she demoted uh, Mark's opinion on the basis of, of something that she should not believe, uh, that she would be doing something epistemically incorrect. So, this is why we have the second assumption. The third assumption is that the truth of Alison knowledge self ascription depends on an epistemic standard. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of, of what that exactly means. There's like lots of debate uh, on the uh, truth conditions of uh, knowledge ascriptions. I think I can, I mean, we can, we can discuss this more on the, during the Q&A, but I think I can afford to remain neutral uh, between contextualist and relativist accounts of knowledge ascriptions. I don't know about if invariantist accounts, but I'm a little bit skeptical of invariantist accounts to begin with. So uh, this is not going to be a huge problem uh, for me. Uh, Fourth claim, which is my claim about the epistemic significance of this agreement. After the discovery of this agreement, error possibilities uh, concerning the, the status, the doxastic uh, justification was believed, become more salient than they were before. And to put it differently, before and after the uh, discovery of this agreement, the context changes. Okay? Uh, so there, is the, there are these new error possibilities which concern exactly the fact whether uh, one's belief that P is supported by the evidence. Uh, okay? So, one, it becomes more salient the possibility that one's belief is actually not the one that is best supported by the evidence. Okay? And so, five, uh, five, <coughs> fifth step, the salience of the error possibilities induces a higher standard for the truth of Alison's self ascription and it seems that what Alison has to do after the discovery of this agreement in order for her to uh, uh, for her knowledge self ascription to be true she has to rule more error possibilities out okay so and in order for Alison to correctly demote Mark's opinion she has to rule error possibilities new the, the error possibilities out new and more salient error possibilities out or else she should uh, uh, accept some of them as actual as she should refrain herself from claiming that she knows that the belief that he is the one that is best supported by the evidence. So, what, what does this tell us about the epistemic significance of peer disagreement? Well, it tells us that when we discover a disagreement with an epistemic peer, it gets more difficult to resolve 
the disagreement, because we should do more work, it gets more difficult to resolve the disagreement in a non-dogmatic non way, okay? Uh, in the way in which, for instance, Kelly is proposing to do, okay? And so the idea is that the discovery of disagreement as an epistemic effect and the epistemic effect consequence, or significance if you want, is that of making the resolution of disagreement uh, uh, more difficult uh, from an epistemic point of view than it was before the discovery of such a disagreement. Okay? So, this completes my understanding of uh, the epistemic significance of disagreement. So this is my, my way of endorsing the appearance, which hopefully is different from the one which has been proposed by other uh, 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 people from the evidential understanding that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so now we get to uh, uh, the big question. What should peers do? Okay, in light, in light of all of this. Well, the claim here is that in order for Alison to correctly demote Mark's opinion, uh, 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 she, uh, Mark Alison has to uh, rule the error possibilities out. And I very, I mean, in a very simple-minded way, this is what Alison should do after the discovery of their disagreement uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with Mark, okay? And in order to do so, I'm gonna just introduce this uh, uh, piece of terminology, which says that in order for peers to rule the error possibilities out, or at least to check the, uh, uh, the, error, possibility, the, the error possibilities and to verify whether some of them uh, should be accepted as, act, uh, as actual and some of them should be ruled out, uh, the peers have, should reopen the question whether P. What does it mean to reopen the question whether P? Well, it means to engage oneself in a sort of uh, cognitive inquisitive activity which is a truth promoting activity. It is something uh, whereby we seek to rule out error possibilities or to accept some of them actually in order to improve our epistemic situation. And roughly put, this kind of epistemic uh, activity consists of many things. Uh, for instance, going over the shared body of evidence by evaluating its extension, carefully reassessing its probative force, double checking the reasoning uh, whereby one has put all the evidential items together, uh, or if uh, this is the case, looking for new evidence and arguments to come to a verdict about peace truth. So, how peers should respond to disagreement? Well, in this way, by uh, uh, reopening the question whether P. Uh, and as I said before, as I was trying to suggest already, reopening the question enables peer to determine which, if any, error possibilities made salient by discovery of disagreement should be ruled out or accepted as actual. And in many cases, this will enable them to establish what to believe. For sure, this, this is going to enable them to establish what to believe in easy cases, such as the restaurant case. And uh, I want to go back to more complex cases at the end. Okay, this is just to give a sketch of the view. Uh, all right, so, uh, it, I mean, this seems, I mean, to, this seems uh, uh, a fairly sensible uh, consideration to propose. I mean, you discover disagreement with somebody uh, you respect uh, epistemically, what should you do? Well, just uh, rethink the issue, try to go deeper, try to see whether you, you've made a mistake, try to see whether there's, you, you've missed a piece of evidence, and so, or you have reasoned incorrectly. That seems like uh, a common sense thing to say uh, for us. But the real question, I guess, that should interest us is the following. What does happen to the peers' initial doxastic attitudes after the discovery of this group? Okay. So the peers, the two peers started with like the belief that P, suppose believing the P and disbelieving the P. Uh, and uh, now I'm saying I've tried to say that the discovery of this agreement is, uh, has not the specific significance that should force uh, the peers to revise their beliefs, or to suspend judgment about this, uh, about the issue, but still I haven't said anything about what does it happen to the peers' initial beliefs, 
are they entitled to stick to their guns while reopening the question or not? That's the question I want to address now. Okay. And the, a better way of uh, looking at this question is to ask uh, what is uh, the attitude one has towards the proposition uh, uh, when one reopens the question quite a key. If you, or if you want to put in a, the matter in a slightly different way, what is the reopening state of mind? What is the inquiry uh, 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 state of mind? Okay. What kind of metastatic we are in while uh, carrying out this epistemic uh, activity of reopening the question? And I guess that what we are looking for, these are uh, two general considerations. Uh, uh, Functionally, uh, uh, it seems that the kind of mental state we are in while reopening the question is a mental state uh, we are in where we are especially sensitive to information, to acquiring new information, and uh, we are disposed, uh, uh, we have relevant dispositions, uh, dispositions that are relevant towards finding out an answer to uh, the question, so to closing. Uh, the question whether a given proposition uh, P is true or false. And I'm going to say something more uh, uh, later on uh, on this. And another interesting aspect, it seems to me, another interesting normative aspect of this inquiring state of mind, it seems that reopening uh, uh, the question whether P, which is this sort of uh, inquisitive activity towards uh, the uh, truth of the proposition of P, seems somehow to be normatively at odds with knowledge, with knowing the proposition. I guess that there is, a, a, I'm speaking of normative incompatibility because uh, reopening the question whether P and knowing, and while knowing at the same time the P, seems to me to be metaphysically compossible. I forget one, one thing, suppose, uh, that I know, uh, that I knew yesterday, and what I do, I reopen the question, I look for evidence, I, uh, I look for new information, then I get to the answer to the question, but then I remember that uh, I knew uh, the answer to the, uh, the question uh, yesterday. And it seems that since I knew it all along, it seems that I did something inappropriate from an epistemic point of view. Uh, since uh, I knew the, uh, the, uh, the proposition, I knew that the proposition was uh, true, uh, and I didn't really have uh, a need to reopen the question from a normative point of view. Okay? And so it seems that if one knows the P, then it is inappropriate for one to reopen the question whether P. Okay? So this is the kind of mental state we are in while reopening the question, uh, 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 the truth of a given proposition. What, what comes next? Okay. Uh, now, what I want to try to do is to rely on something that I take to be relatively uncontroversial, which is the fact uh, that there is a, a, a plurality of ways of regarding a proposition as true. Okay? And I'm going to use this piece of terminology. I'm going to say, I'm going to use the notion of acceptance in order to, co to cover the cognitive genius uh, of propositional attitudes. And, uh, I'm going to just say very generally that to accept the proposition is to treat it as true and to ignore that it's false. Okay, so acceptance is this all-encompassing notion, and I'm going to say that an individual accepts propositions in various cognitive modes. So there's the belief mode, the assumption mode, the imagination mode if we allow uh, uh, for a propositional imagination, and the hypothesis. So we believe the P, we assume the P, uh, we hypothesize the P. And all these mental states are functionally and have different functional and normative profiles. Okay? I take this to be uh, relatively uncontroversial. Uh, it's very hard to distinguish between all these different ways of regarding a proposition. It's true, okay? What I want to do now, actually, is to focus on the difference between what we might call the belief mode and the hypothesis mode. Okay? 
Yes. And this is going to be uh, important in my strategy because what I want to claim at the end of the day is that while reopening the question whether P, uh, uh, the two specific peers have to entertain propositions in the hypothesis mode rather than in the belief mode. And so they are, have to revise their conditions after the discovery of disagreement. But the revision is not within the belief mode as it were. It's not a decreasing degree of confidence, but it is moving from one mode, uh, the belief mode, to the hypothesis. That's going to be the, uh, the, 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 the view that I want to suggest. Okay, so focus on the belief mode and the hypothesis mode. Uh, uh, so, okay, uh, exactly, this is what I, I want to I try to, uh, to do right now. So first step is to distinguish between the belief mode and the hypothesis mode. I don't have any like not, I mean strong uh, argument in favor of the distinction. I want to just to propose to put forward some considerations. I think there are going to be like four considerations to distinguish between uh, attitudes in the belief mode and attitudes in the hypothesis mode. Okay, and then I will see whether you'll be uh, uh, whether we will be convinced by these considerations or not. So first, it's a very basic and uh, almost phen phenomenological consideration. Look at all our even everyday inquiries into questions, into the truth of a, a proposition. What do we do? I mean, uh, if I'm in a, a mood of knowing how many people are out there, so I open the question of how many people are out there and what, what I do. Well, I start with this very neutral, very open-minded uh, uh, state of mind, okay, uh, in which I wonder, for instance, whether P, I'm curious about whether P, uh, uh, I'm open-minded about what the answer to that question is. And what I do, well, I mean, I start inquiring into this question, I go outside, I look out of the window, ask somebody who is in better position but, uh, than, than I am right now because I don't see through the windows, and uh, so I conduct this very quick inquiry, and I close the inquiry by believing. Uh, I close the inquiry by believing directly that there are like four people out there in the room. And I think that most of our uh, inquiries, uh, everyday inquiries, are like that. So we wonder, we collect evidence, and we just go straight directly to believe uh, a given proposition. And we close the inquiry into the question in that way. Yet, I believe that there are certain cases in which our uh, inquiry into the truth of proposition are a little bit more complex. And are complex in this sense. We start off with this very open-minded mental state, okay? Then we start collecting evidence, information. We start to reason about the question. We deliberate about whether a proposition is, P, uh, is true or false. Perhaps we have like competing candidate answers to this question. And before getting to closing the inquiry by believing a given proposition, we start to have some sort of cognitive inclination towards a given answer. So we start, to, uh, we start to lean towards, for instance, the truth of the proposition. Uh, we wanna, and when we do so, we hypothesize that a given proposition is true. I mean, this happens to me really, I mean, all the time, especially when I struggle with when I'm in a philosophical mood and I struggle with philosophical questions, I just I don't go directly to believing a question. I'm more tentative. I have this uh, sort of cognitive inclination. This ah, this might be the good solution, the good answer to this philosophical puzzle. Let me put forward this hypothesis. Let me give more consideration to a given answer to a question rather than the other candidate answers because I take it to be the most promising. Uh, answer the question, and I focus my inquiry on that kind of answer, on whether, on whether the proposition P, for instance, is true, and I start to compare the evidence, and I look for the information, and I see whether the information actually supports uh, the truth rather than falsehood of the proposition. So I take this to be like the first consideration phenomenologically. Perhaps you disagree, and I'm the, the only one who is very cautious about, uh, about things. Uh, uh, before believing, I hypothesize a lot. That's, I mean, speaking for myself. And I think this is a genuine phenomenon. So, uh, it seems that there is room for distinguishing between uh, uh, hypothesis and uh, belief. Okay. Uh, 
Then, uh, before getting to this, it seems that we can associate different kinds of dispositions with a mental state of belief and a mental state of uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, depending on our uh, conception of, uh, of uh, our uh, kind of conception of belief. Uh, if we have a rich uh, liberal conception of belief, we can say that, for instance, we associate different kinds of dispositions uh, with the state of belief. So just to make an example, uh, suppose that we associate phenomenal dispositions we uh, uh, believe, we can say the same with respect to hypothesis, and we can trace a distinction uh, between an attitude of hypothesis and an attitude of belief. So to make the example that uh, Shri uh, Eric Schwitzkabel makes in his paper on the liberal dispositional account of belief, suppose I believe that in free J there's beer, and I hypothesize uh, uh, also that in free J uh, uh, that there's coal. I go, uh, open the fridge, and it seems that plausible to say that I would be much more surprised if I didn't find the beer rather than the coal. So this seems to me to suggest that there is a way of distinguishing between the phenomenal dispositions, between be uh, attitudes of belief and attitudes of hypothesis, by saying that the phenomenal dispositions associated with the attitude of hypothesis <laughs> are less vivid than the uh, phenomenal dispositions associated with the attitude of uh, belief. Uh, same sort of consideration can be made with respect to non-verbal dispositions and uh, even with respect to verbal ones. Uh, it's a point I'm going to get back to uh, later on. So if we take belief uh, to be, uh, if, we take, if we take the disposition to assert a proposition, to be disposition associated with the state of belief, it seems plausible to say that there are other kinds of speech acts which have different illocutionary forces. Uh, whereby we communicate our take on uh, the reality. And for instance, Steve Williamson has suggested the idea that we can distinguish between the speech act of assertion, of asserting P, and the speech act of conjecturing uh, the P. So there is room even for distinguishing between uh, uh, attitudes of belief and attitudes of hypothesis with respect to the verbal dispositions that are associated with these two different states. Uh, so and this, this is a second way of bringing out the difference between the two uh, kinds of mental states. Then, uh, this, uh, I'm not sure how this is going to be helpful because the, uh, a metaphor is a metaphor. Uh, usually we say that belief aims at truth, okay, this, but we should take this, I guess, metaphorically. Uh, but actually I think that we can make a distinction between different ways of aiming at truth, that different cognitive attitudes cognitive proposition attitudes have, and for instance, uh, we can say that one accepts P in the belief mode just in case one regards P as true for the sake of getting P's truth value right, and one accepts P in the hypothesis mode just in case one regards P as true for the sake of the inquiry into P's truth value. So this would be like two different, slightly different way of articulating the A metaphor, which uh, again, suggests the existence of a distinction between the two kinds of mental states. And uh, normative profile, belief is usually taken to be subject to the truth norm, one ought to accept P in the belief mode, only if P, and uh, we, can, we could try to associate a different kind of norm with a uh, uh, hypothesis mode, uh, which might go as follows, one may accept P in the hypothesis mode if this allows one to make progress with inquiry into peace, truth, value. So, it seems that we can distinguish between attitudes of belief and attitudes of hypothesis. And these are some considerations that should support this distinction. Now, uh, what I want to say, what kind is the reopening state of mind? So is the mental state we are, five? Okay, thanks. Uh, that, that's going to be fine. Uh, is the mental state we are in, while reopening the question, more similar to a state of belief or more similar to a state of hypothesis. And the hypothesis that I put forward is that it is more similar to a state of hypothesis rather than a state of belief. And I'm going to offer uh, uh, two uh, main uh, considerations here. First of, first of all, uh, a consideration which has to do with the verbal disposition that we associate with, uh, at, uh, with attitudes held in the belief mode. Uh, so it seems to me that one reop when, when one reopens the question whether P, one is not disposed to assert the P. Okay. Uh, 
And I'm going to try to break this out by looking at a specific view uh, of what assertion is, which is a uh, sort of view that has been defined by Robert Brandom, which says that assertion is a commitment, uh, can be understood as a commitment to authorize the hearer to assert P and to take up the challenge of vindicating the assertion by offering considerations that justify it. It seems to me that both uh, parts are me are missing when we reopen the question whether P. For what reason? First of all, because when we reopen the question whether P, we're actually checking whether we got it right. So it seems that we don't want to uh, uh, take up the commitment of authorizing somebody else to say, well, yeah, assert that P, because what we are actually doing is to check whether P is the case. And similarly, vindicating the assertion, it seems that actually to presuppose the kind of work that the uh, reopening activity does, namely checking uh, whether the error possibilities that become more salient are uh, actual or not, once we have done that, we're going to be in, the posi in a position to vindicate the assertion. So this is the first consideration that uh, 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 suggests that uh, the reopening state of mind is not uh, uh, best identified with a, uh, with a belief state. And the second consideration I want to offer is uh, related to uh, the normative profile of the uh, inquiring state of mind, of the reopening state of mind. I'm using this interchangeably, somehow interchangeably. So I try to suggest there is some inappropriateness of, a bit, uh, of reopening uh, the question whether P, while at the same time knowing uh, the P. How can we make sense of, of this? Uh, here is uh, an explanation that uh, we could provide. First of all, it is, let's assume that it is inappropriate, somewhat well, epistemically inappropriate, to have distinct exhaustive attitudes towards the same proposition at the same time. Now, let's assume, which is uncontroversial, I mean, relatively uncontroversial, that knowledge entails belief. So, in my, uh, in my uh, jargon, knowledge entails acceptance in belief mode. If I accept that reopening, entails acceptance in, this, in the hypo hypothesis mode and I accept that the belief mode is different from the hypothesis mode what I can, what I can conclude? Well, I can conclude that if I uh, reopen the question whether P, while knowing the P I would both uh, believe the P and hypothesize the P and uh, it's inappropriate to have this uh, doxastic attitude towards the same proposition at the same time. So this provides an explanation of why there is this, some, this sort of normative contrast between the two of them. All right, so uh, just to uh, uh, wrap it up, uh, peers should reopen the question whether P and revise their cognitions towards P from the belief mode to the hypothesis mode. What my answer does not say is that we should remain in the hypothesis mode forever, okay? Just bear in mind that th this activity of reopening is meant to uh, uh, uncover whether one has made a mistake or not. And in many cases, uh, this is going to be the case. Okay? In many cases, what peers should believe after the discovery of this agreement will vary depending on the outcome of this specific reopening activity. And so uh, we rule out the epistemic possibility. We can demote the opponent's opinion. And so we could, for instance, stick to our guns or revise accordingly, depending on uh, how this process goes. There are, more, uh, uh, there are cheaper cases, for instance, moral disagreements. Are they, are they cheaper than uh, everyday cases? In a sense, yes. In a sense, no. Mo many moral disagreements have to do with the fact that we make factual errors, and so the reopening question, uh, the reopening activity will enable us to uncover them. We make er uh, reasoning errors, and this is, again, something that we can uncover through this process. Sometimes there's indeterminacy, and this is going to be a huge problem independently uh, of uh, 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 this way of resolving peer disagreement. Uh, there are cases in which there are moral ties, uh, and these are possible even for objectivists, and so there are cases in which, after the reopening process, we, we just find out that we should stick to our guns. So, so we go from a belief to hypothesis mode, we get back to the initial belief. And there are the most uh, uh, interesting cases, namely cases which we don't find anything uh, uh, conclusive through this reopening process. 
And what should we do in these cases? Well, my view is that we should keep on inquiring the question at say by having contrasting attitudes in the hypothesis mode towards this question. Uh, so, uh, briefly put, how do I uh, save the uh, uh, three constraints? I've tried to give an account of the epistemic significance. Uh, uh, this account enables us to demote non-dogmatically the opponent's opinion because we do so on the basis of the reopening process and not just by saying, well, look, you disagree and so you're wrong. So this reopening process is what enables us to demote the opponent's opinion in a non-dogmatic way, and yet this final intuition, well, it depends. It depends on what cases we want to focus. The most difficult cases are the cases in which we should keep on investigating, inquiring into the question, and there's a sense in which we save the anti spinalness intuition, because my view says that we should keep on, I keep on having our cognitive inclination towards the truth and the falsity of the proposition. So there's a sense in which we can still somehow stick to our initial response, to our uh, 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 being inclined towards the uh, truth of a given proposition while still inquiring into the question. And that's going to be it. Thank you.